So this month is Osteoporosis Awareness Month. For this occasion, I want to talk about from our perspective as people who treat, help people reverse and educate worldwide on the topic of osteoporosis. What I want to do for this video is to talk about the top five groups that need to be aware of their bone health. Over the last few years, we've seen hundreds of patients with osteoporosis. So for us, Osteoporosis Awareness Month actually means so much more than it used to. So many of our patients actually come from a pretty surprising background, or at least it used to be surprising. Yes, the majority are over the age of 50 and female and have osteoporosis, but we have patients that fall outside of that norm as well. And it's outside of that norm that I want to talk about today. I want to talk about these five groups that need to pay attention to their bone health. And again, these may surprise you because they used to surprise me. So please watch this video to see if someone that you care about actually is at risk and needs to pay special attention to their bone health. Now, I'll talk about what to do if you or someone you love actually does fit in one of these groups. But first, let's just review what these groups are. Now, the first group that surprised me when we first started this practice was our young female athletes. Now, I know that our young female athletes are at risk of developing osteoporosis later in life, for sure. We see that as a common risk factor. But what I'm talking about is actually having osteoporosis or low bend density as a young female athlete. I'm talking teens, 20s, 30s. So the primary risk factor here is amenorrhea or not having a regular menstrual cycle. Now, this could occur because of low energy availability, specifically what used to be called the female athlete triad, now is called red S or relative energy deficiency in sport. And essentially what this means is that the body is being pushed too hard. It doesn't have the energy and resources to do all the things that it needs to do to have a regular menstrual cycle. And these women will end up amenorrheic, not having cycles and not having that normal push pull of estrogen throughout the month, which is so critical for bone health. Now, this could also be due to or compounded by oral contraceptives, which I'm preparing uh, an additional video on, but oral contraceptives that actually stop menstruation, that actually stop ovulation can have a negative impact on bone as well. Again, I look forward to preparing a video on that topic and presenting that data. There's also a genetic component here. The type of sport also matters here. So particularly long distance runners, ultra endurance runners, swimmers are going to find themselves at higher risk than other long distance athletes. And then of course, diet matters. So for some of these sports, it is a, a weight to strength ratio sport and being lighter is better from a performance perspective, but everybody has their threshold at which they're too light, they're too lean, and their body is not gonna function well. And I think it is really common in the, the more competitive side of this for women to get relatively unhealthy relatively quickly. And we need to be screening this patient population on a regular basis because I have had so many patients in their 20s and 30s that have this background. Again, used to surprise me. Now I actually anticipate it. And I would love to get screening in front of this population on a regular basis, probably quarterly or at least twice a year to monitor for that loss in bone mass and bone health. All right. The second group we're going to talk about is the GLP-1 weight loss group. So Ozempic, terzepatide, Munjaro, um, all of these drugs that are out there now that are GLP, GIP drugs that are helping people to lose weight. This is a controversial space. But if you look at some of the data, we can see that, and you hear this all the time, that 60% of the weight loss might be coming from muscle. That's actually not what the studies say. What the studies say is that 60% of the weight loss in some of these studies is coming from lean mass. Lean mass includes muscle and bone. Now remember that obesity, even just by itself, does not actually protect against osteoporosis. So some of these patients using these drugs have never been screened and they don't know it, but they already have low bone mass. There is a, a subgroup of people that struggle with weight and obesity that have a tremendous amount of inflammation, some of them are inactive, some of them are nutrient deficient, actually not eating adequate nutrients in the first place. So they are actually at much higher risk. And now as they're losing weight with these drugs, they're losing lean mass and it's making the problem so much worse and they just don't know it. 
So from my perspective, we absolutely have to screen anybody who is using a GLP-1 or a GIP drug. We need to be looking at body composition and we need to be looking at bone health as they go through this. We also should probably look at other causes of hormone dysfunction or genetics or other things that are associated with loss and try to put that whole picture together for people that are gonna use these drugs. Now, swimmers are another group we need to talk about because swimmers actually are in a, a low gravity environment out of the gate. So yes, you could be working really hard, doing cardio, doing strength, you know, in the pool, doing sprints, whatever, but it's not enough muscular force to stimulate bone. You have no impact and you have reduced gravity. So swimmers actually are at greater risk than any other endurance athlete uh, for low bone density. And then we get into the runners. Now, I think there is definitely a difference between running, let's say, you know, whatever, three, five miles a week versus people who are training for ultra long distance events. So for people that are training very long distances, if you're gonna compete in a 50 mile, 100 mile event, you have to do a lot of miles. So what happens as you start increasing the mileage like this is that your body is going to just start to change your body composition to accommodate for the stress that it's under. Our body does this for everything that we do. So if you're working from the perspective of being able to go very, very long distances, then your body is going to offload whatever it needs to survive in that scenario. And that's going to be muscle and bone, right? So these individuals tend to be very light, very lean, not a lot of muscle. And unfortunately, that comes with not a lot of bone. So even though, yes, you have the pitter-patter impact of running, it's not enough impact to actually stimulate bone. Group number four, men on testosterone replacement therapy with aromatase inhibitors. Now, this is an interesting problem because you see a lot of men that have great testosterone levels, but their providers were trained to use aromatase inhibitors to block the conversion of testosterone to estrogen, which can be helpful from a symptoms perspective, depending on the situation. I was actually trained this way and I started out my practice this way and we went away from it when I realized that men need estradiol to protect their bones, their heart, and their brain, just like women. We only get it from testosterone. So as I do the labs and I look at biomarkers for my men, I wanna make sure that they have adequate estradiol and I've stopped using aromatase inhibitors. I don't have a single patient that has estradiol that I would consider quote unquote too high. So my, my concern and my fear around this is that when I look at labs coming in from other providers, men that are using some uh, not well run online programs that are on testosterone and AI, they've got great testosterone, but their uh, estrogen levels are zero. I mean, zero. So they're completely suppressing the aromatization of testosterone into estrogen. This is going to put them at risk for osteoporosis. So while men might have a higher starting point, these men are going to be at increased risk, especially the guys that are doing this sort of for bodybuilding or performance at a younger age. They're going to have a uh, much steeper decline of bone health if they even had good bone density and quality to begin with. All right, group number five. Now, this is sort of an obvious one, but yet it doesn't seem to be obvious to most people. So this group is women who are at menopause, meaning women generally around 50 years old who are not technically at the screening age for osteoporosis. So this one drives me nuts because we know that as a woman goes through menopause, when she loses her natural endogenous sex hormone production, she will see a loss of bone mass. It's just predictable. We know that this is gonna happen. And yet we don't screen for osteoporosis until 65 in the United States. So here's my question is, how can we have a conversation around the risk benefit of hormone replacement therapy for these women if we don't know what their bone density and quality is? I see so many times women who come to me in their 60s who went through menopause, let's say 15 years ago, within a decade of the WHI. And as a result of that, they were not offered even a conversation about HRT. And now they have osteoporosis and regret. And so for me, when I think about any woman going through menopause, regardless of her family history, her background, her medical history, whatever, we need to have the conversation to say, look, these are the potential benefits and these are the potential risks of using hormone replacement. If you're having that conversation without knowing someone's bone quality and density, then you can't have an accurate risk benefit equation because you don't know the potential benefits. If that woman already has osteoporosis, it's a very different conversation than if she doesn't. 
So we absolutely have to be screening all women as they go through perimenopause and menopause so we can have this conversation around hormones in an objective way so we can truly understand what are the risks, what are the benefits, is this going to benefit your bone? Because remember that even the FDA in the United States has approved estradiol as a treatment for the prevention of osteoporosis. But how are you going to know if you need to use it if you haven't been screened? And this is where there's just so much discordance here. It really drives me nuts. All right. So what do we do about it? If you're in one of those five groups or anybody else who is at risk for osteoporosis, from my perspective, we screen my goal would be to get every 30-year-old in front of screening for osteoporosis, whether it be a DEXA or a REMS. And I'll explain the difference here in a second. But I want to get every young adult in front of a screening modality so we can understand what their bone density and quality is. Now, for young female athletes, I think probably even earlier and probably more frequently because we see this as such a big problem. Now, the second time that I really want to push this is, again, at menopause for women because we can't have that HRT conversation without knowing what your bone density and quality is like. Now, the difference between the two common modalities that are available, clearly there's DEXA. Now, DEXA is globally available, might be covered by your insurance, but it only tells you density. The TBS or trabecular bone score that's tied onto it can give us some additional information about quality, but the ultrasound version, the REMS, gives us even more information. It gives you both a T-score for density and a fragility score for quality, but the REMS is not globally available, uh, not covered by insurance, gonna be a little bit more expensive. So there's the two options. I would use either one rather than none. I prefer REMS if we have access to it over DEXA, but oftentimes we end up with both. So then the last question on this is how often should you screen? Well, this is hotly debated, but again, it depends on your start point and it depends on the results of the screening. So if I have a young female athlete who has low bone mass already, I'm going to screen her, especially if I have access to an Ecolite REMS, I'm probably going to screen her every six months or maybe even more because I want to watch for that decline. And then if we are seeing decline, let's do something about it. Now, if you have good bone mass and, and you're not at risk for bone loss and everything seems to be good, then probably we're talking one years, two years, maybe even five years under some circumstances. So these recommendations aren't out yet. And I look at every single person differently, uh, but I do think that we need to start early and we need to decide what frequency makes sense depending on that person's unique situation. So that's it for today. Happy Osteoporosis Awareness Month. And remember that a diagnosis of osteoporosis is at the end but deciding to reverse it is a beginning. I'll see you in the next video.